So my name is Jennifer uh, Summers. I am with the, uh, a board member of the uh, Conservation Education and Outreach Working Group. And I am here today to introduce our speaker and to talk a little bit about our webinar series. So before I introduce our speaker today, um, first I'd like to just mention a couple of announcements with the uh, Conservation Education and Working Group has coming up. So first of all, this webinar series is going to continue into July. So we have um, the next one coming up is July 12th. And that will also that was featuring Dr. Laura Downey. So please mark your calendars for that. And all of these seminars are being recorded. So you can either access these recordings from um, either the University of Kentucky's Forestry Extension YouTube channel, or you can access them from the uh, Wildlife uh, National. I'm sorry, uh, TWS's website, if you look up um, our working group under TWS's uh, website, the recordings are posted there as well. Um, so if you have any questions about that, feel free to contact one of us. Um, so, and then also wanted to mention that at the national TWS conference that's coming up in Spokane in 2022, we are hosting or sponsoring a workshop called Presentation Matters. So when you register for your conference, be sure to check that out. And it's a half day workshop. It'll be on Sunday, November 6th from 1 to 5 p.m. So consider registering for that um, to learn more about your pre presentation skills. So in, um, without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker today. Um, I'm going to introduce our speaker, Scott Hengstrom. Uh, he is a professor of wildlife ecology and the director of the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife at the University of Stevens Point. He's also my direct supervisor. Um, so I have to say very nice things about him. <laughs> so Scott Hengstrom holds a BS in biology slash conservation from the University of Wisconsin River Falls and a master's in natural resources from UW Stevens Point and also a PhD in wildlife ecology from UW Madison. Um, he's worked through the professional ranks and served as an extension wildlife specialist at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln from 1988 to 2014, and he continues his extension work at UW-Stevens Point today. Scott is a certified wildlife biologist with the Wildlife Society and has served as the president of two state chapters, TWS chapters, uh, one in Nebraska and one in Wisconsin, and has served as the chair of three TWS working groups, including the Wildlife Damage Management Working Group, Wildlife Diseases Working Group, and the Hunting, Trapping, and Conservation Working Group. Scott currently serves, as I mentioned, as the, direct, uh, the Douglas Arch Stevens Endowed Chair and Director of the Wild, <laughs> excuse me, uh, of the Wildlife Center, Wisconsin Center for Wildlife at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. He will be speaking with us today about successful strategies for conservation education, extension, and outreach. So thank you and welcome Scott Hengstrom. Well, thank you, Jennifer, and, and hello to everybody out there. Um, I see familiar faces on the, uh, the, the list of people who are participating in the workshop. Uh, I really wish we were able to be together uh, for this workshop and, and I look forward to seeing some familiar faces out there in Spokane uh, here this fall. But uh, as you know, with, with our current uh, paradigm and, and also our opportunities to expand this message out to a wide range of people, it's an opportunity to do a webinar like this and, and record it and hopefully we'll have uh, lots of viewership uh, throughout uh, throughout this year. Um, I'll jump into my PowerPoint here. I'm gonna have to find my controls. Where did the share screen? There we go. Screen two. And I hope that that uh, is helpful for you. You should be able to see a screen that shows the, uh, the promo for the program that we had today. Um, and as far as uh, this, this idea of successful strategies for conservation education, extension, um, outreach, you know, it came to me to, to you know, convey this through this uh, conservation education working group. Um, and, and before I get rolling too far, I really do want to say thank you uh, for being invited to, to present to you. Um, I've been a member of this working group for quite some time, and uh, I just plucked these goals out of the charter of the working group that was initiated back in 1998. And uh, I, I appreciate all of the efforts of the, the people who have been involved with the current working group leadership. Um, uh, Maureen Frank, I know you're out there. Renee Williams, you're on. Lauren Hildreth, Jennifer, uh, who introduced me, and many others who have been involved in putting on this webinar series. It's, it's a great thing for the working group to be able to be assisting other people and wildlife society members in this way. 
I also want to just mention uh, some of the past leaders that we've had in the working group with Terry Mesmer, Nikki Frey, uh, Anne Ronke, and, and several others, because they laid the foundation for this working group and have helped to move things along and still are active members within, within the working group. So it's, it's been a fun group to be involved with. As for our successful strategies for consternation education and outreach, <clears throat> You know, I, I, I suspect that you were probably thinking of a really well-researched and thoughtful thesis on, on uh, what we know of as Mintzberg's five P's of strategy development um, that involves ploy pattern position, perspective plan. Well, I'm sorry, folks. Um, I've had some things that came up in my life, and so I wasn't able to create something quite so deep and extensive uh, in dealing with weaving this this paradigm into, into conservation education. Um, perhaps more of what I would consider the presentation today is gonna to be brain droppings. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I spent some time on the road yesterday thinking about this, three hours on the road coming back home. I've been involved with uh, caring for my father who was diagnosed earlier this year with, with cancer. And he's been going undergoing chemotherapy and I've helped him very recently as in Saturday with a uh, farm auction. And, uh, you know, priorities, that's going to be one of the things I'll be talking about. Uh, priorities took over and I had to push some things back. And, and this was actually one of them. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, three hours on the road, I've had been able to think about this. And hopefully uh, you'll appreciate some of the brain droppings. I do need to convey and, and credit George Carlin here, um, who was a really well-known comedian in his book and routine, challenged many of our views uh, from a social, political, and, and environmental perspective as well. So kudos to George Carlin. Um, <clears throat> as for, for my idea of, of my ideas of perhaps why I get to speak <laughs> on conservation uh, or educational strategies is uh, I guess I've been along around for a while. Uh, and somebody, you know, eventually is going to listen to me. Um, I was an extension assistant uh, working with Scott Craven at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in, in 1985 through 1988. Uh, I was working on a PhD at the same time, but also involved in many extension programs uh, uh, with Scott. And uh, I got a job right away after graduating with my PhD in 1988. Um, and through 2014, I was an extension wildlife specialist with the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. And there I was able to uh, work in a wide range of extension programs, especially in wildlife and wildlife damage management. And, uh, you know, I gained a lot of experience and information uh, you know, through working there. In 2014, I, I, I actually moved back to uh, my home state of Wisconsin and I started working at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point and I've been there ever since. And uh, it's kind of strange to think that I've actually been around this extension world for nearly 40 years. Um, but I guess if you hang around long enough, eventually you get recognized. And then here's a, a little picture of me that I'm, I'm actually pretty kind of proud of as, as I was inducted as a fellow of the Wildlife Society. <clears throat> that was in uh, 2021. And so um, my ob objective today is provide you with a collection of ideas that uh, may help you to advance your careers in uh, conservation education. And, uh, you know, I'm coming from an extension background, understand, but I think many of my thoughts might be applicable to whether you're from a state agency, federal agency, private industry, you know, wherever. So uh, I guess here we go. <laughs> Now, my number one item I have for, for successful strategies is, is this, don't worry, be happy. <laughs> and this may trigger some memories of, of some of you, and you're probably reeling that song through your mind now. Um, in every life, we have some trouble, but when you worry, you make it double, don't worry, do, 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 do. be happy. Okay, you didn't expect anybody was going to sing for you today, did you? Um, uh, you can chuckle anytime you want. Uh, this is a, a message that I convey to you because uh, a lot of people get wrapped up in their work and their stress and their everyday life. And we have so many stressors that come at us and you throw on top of all this, the recent pandemic that we're dealing with and health issues. And my gosh, it's, a, it's amazing that any of us can, can handle it. But uh, nonetheless, if you take the approach that, that uh, perhaps I have and many others, you figure out a way of going through life um, by not getting too, too worried about a variety of, of issues. 
and just uh, kind of rolling along with the punches. And it, it is really amazing how we have the capacity to handle a, a multitude of, of responsibilities, many of them very challenging if you kind of take the right mindset to it. So that's a theme that's going to kind of come through as, as you'll see in, in, in a little bit later in the presentation. My second item, and this may seem very strange coming right after don't worry, be happy, is, um, is uh, sweat the details. You know, the people who really work and pay attention to detailed aspects associated with extension outreach type programs, I find them to be very successful. And I'm going to call your attention to, to some of you old folks out there who have been in this business for a while. Um, uh, you know, you've been doing extension presentations programs. And how many of you have been up there on the stage ready to start presenting? And then you forgot to turn out the lights. And then you don't know how to turn out the lights. Okay. I've seen that happen many to many speakers. This happens to me. It's happened to me once too. And the point is, if you take care of those little minute details in extension outreach presentations, um, you'll be able to deliver a very smooth program and you get the confidence of the audience immediately and your presentation will roll off very, very nicely. As we move forward in time, um, how many of you have used those 35 millimeter slides in the slide carousel that you had to drop those slides in and put on a projector? Uh, looking at the people participating, maybe not many of you, but speaking in long, you know, from, from the old school, uh, oftentimes those slides would get turned around backwards and you'd project the image and the slide would be backwards. Oh, there's nothing worse than seeing that. And it's just a point of being uh, paying attention to details. Uh, moving forward, you know, maybe 15, 20 years ago, people had problems with the interface between uh, computer projectors and PowerPoint or whatever package you were using. And sure enough, you'd get all kinds of strange looking text. And uh, if you didn't pay attention to details like that, your presentations would not come off nicely. Nowadays, we're talking about internet connectivity and bandwidth and a variety of electronic issues that, that can become a bugaboo in presentations. So my point here is, uh, you know, sweat the small stuff. And I'm not trying to say worry about the small stuff, but to pay attention to the details and in, in extension outreach programs, as well as presentations, whatever your, your venue may be. Now, I know there's some of you that are out there raising your hands, you know, hey, hey, wait a minute. What about this book uh, that says, don't sweat the small stuff? And it's all small stuff. <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of an interesting paradigm, the carry, carryover, but, but I guess the take home here is that, Sweat the details, but don't let it worry you. Try and figure out a balance in your life so that you can pay attention to detail, but yet not let them become overriding factors that will drive you just absolutely nuts. Um, it's a matter of paying attention to the big picture as well as the small picture and having that capacity to do so. All right, with uh, my next thought, good teams can move mountains. And I think uh, many of you are, are familiar with the, the concept of, of teamwork. And the, the image that you see here is of conservation leaders for tomorrow, instructors and participants. Um, I'm one of those instructors, uh, and there are about 150 uh, across the United States right now, uh, conservation leaders for tomorrow program. It essentially takes our best and brightest university students in wildlife programs who have very little experience in hunting or shooting programs. And the same is true with agency personnel. Uh, those who have a little experience, and, and I'm talking about wildlife agency personnel, and giving an, them an education on hunting, about what it's about, the motivations of hunters, the tools that hunters use, the nouns that they use, and so therefore they are far more well-versed in, in, in being able to communicate with the people who oftentimes uh, you know, essentially pay their, their paycheck. Um, and so the Conservation Leaders for Tomorrow program is not the recruitment program. It's not trying to create hunters. It's trying to educate people who work in wildlife about hunting, which is an important tool in the field. Um, it's reached out to over 50 universities, over 50 agencies. There's over 2,000 graduates of these Conservation Leaders for Tomorrow programs. And uh, in 2010, the Conservation Leaders for Tomorrow program received the Wildlife Society's Conservation Education Award. My point is, is that this is an incredible team. It's had uh, tremendous leadership over the years and a lot of hardworking people that have put in a lot of effort and it's been recognized. 
I've been fortunate to be a member of seven different teams over the years um, that have been recognized with awards. Some of them actually with cash awards. And so it's, it's been from CLFT to an extension swine working group at the University of Nebraska, an IPM and schools program. And these were award-winning teams um, in which every single team member had something unique and special to contribute. And it's really been a rewarding experience to be involved in those teams. So I think it's important to get involved in, as, as a team player. Good teams just don't happen overnight either. It takes work. It, you need to be able to put the effort in to make it happen. And by this, I'm, I'm conveying the idea of facilitation. It really is critical to making teams work. And an old extension adage is that uh, by facilitating teams, you need to start by developing association among your team members. They need to share who they are and where they're coming from, you know, because there are differences in individuals who are playing different roles on teams. And through that, eventually you develop communication. You start being able to convey information among these various team members. Ultimately, if you continue down this path, it'll lead to trust. You'll find that these team members now start believing in and trusting those other members. And once you get to that point of trust, these teams then can take action and move mountains. But without going through these steps, and uh, some will call it a nominal group process, but if without going through these steps, you oftentimes won't get to that point with, of trust or action. A little story I have for you is, is I was invited to do some teaching at the conserva uh, Cheetah Conservation uh, Facility in, in Namibia, Ochoaranga, uh, Namibia. And uh, they had a biodiversity class going on at the time. And I was asked to talk about wildlife damage management and uh, to, to teach a lecture on, on wildlife diseases. And I did my two programs and everything went fine. And they were all you know, appreciative. And these were students from all across the world. They were members from England, India, Azerbaijan, Russia, Ethiopia, Iran. Uh, it, it, these were people from all over the world. And, and it, was, it was interesting. Um, after I did my presentation, uh, the coordinator of the program came to me and said, hey, do you know anything about group work, you know, or getting people to work together in teams? I said, well, actually, yeah, I've, I've been trained as a facilitator. Uh, what's the scoop? And, and, and she said, you know, we've had the class. There were 24 students in this class from all over the world. We broke them into different groups, and we wanted them to develop a management plan for elephants in Namibia. And we're just pulling our hair out. It's not working at all. These groups are not meshing. They're not gelling. It's, it's been a nightmare. And they're, they're two weeks into a four-week course. And I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. And so I went there and I did what we call just a nominal group process. We did some training. We started with their small groups. We got them talking among each other and, uh, and sharing with, with the, each other group members where they came from, what were, what's important in their lives, uh, you know, where they were, what their hobbies were, that type of thing. We kept them communicating, kept them rolling. And it was interesting. There was one group in particular that was really dysfunctional initially. Um, there were two men from Ethiopia, there was a woman from India, and, and I don't remember where the fourth uh, partner or teammate was from, but they just did not mesh initially. And I essentially babysat them and I got them talking and I got them explaining who they were and where they were from. And then it came out why they had such difficulty in communicating. It's that, first of all, they didn't go through these steps of association, communication, trust building, et cetera. Um, and the Ethiopian men, they're of a culture in which Ethiopian men are dominant in that culture. And here's an in, a woman from India who fought and clawed her way to the top of her system. And she had to be very forward and outgoing to be able to do that. And the Ethiopian men just did not accept her as, as a part of this team just because of this cultural clash that was going on. But once we took the steps to associate, communicate, get these teams, individuals talking amongst each other, um, things started rolling. And I was there uh, two days later, you know, we were doing safari type stuff and having some fun there as well. And a couple of days later, the coordinators, they came back to me and said, what did you do? It was amazing. Now these teams had totally flipped and they were functional and were actually on the path of making these wildlife management plans. And it was really cool to see things in action in a relatively short time. And I know that the strength of these teams 
can can really be important, but you have to take the proper steps to make it happen. Ah, even teamwork can be a, <laughs> even teamwork can't save a bad idea. All right. Um, item number four: uh, diversity makes better teams. Um, you know that diversity, inclusivity, uh, these are real topical at this point in time. Uh, the Wildlife Society now recognizes diversity in teams, and uh, this is uh, the 2022 uh, award-winning, uh, the diversity award-winning team from South Carolina, Department of Natural Resources. They embarked on a program where they were trying to uh, increase conservation education among Black and Hispanic people in, in, in uh, South Carolina. Uh, so they're award winners. Uh, cheer, cheer, kudos to them. Um, working with teams, it takes effort, as I mentioned before. It also can take, um, take some additional strategy if you are a team leader to be able to recognize different personalities within the members of your teams. I came from a system where uh, at University of Nebraska, they use the Myers-Briggs type indicator. And you have to be careful that you don't use this to stereotype people, but you can use Myers-Briggs personality typing to get a sense of what makes people tick. And, and my example here is that I had a colleague, a good friend of mine, Ron Johnson at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln, who was an extension wildlife specialist. And I was the extension wildlife damage specialist at the time. And I did the personality type and I, I thought, yeah, sure. Somebody's gonna tell me who I am. No way, I don't know about this. And anyway, I took the test and then I had a consultation and, uh, and the, the consultant just nailed me to a T. They told me exactly who I was and I, was, I just was blown away. I am over there on the left side of the scale in the ISTJ with a little bit of E, extroverted uh, nature into that. And, and so the E is extroverted, I is introverted. The S is sensory, the N is intuitive. The T is thinking, the F is feeling, the J is judicial and, and the uh, P is Gotta check it, <laughs> perceptive. Yeah, so these are all different uh, uh, binary components of personalities, but if you put all the four together, you can see these different personality types emerge. And I'm way over there on the left side of that, uh, of that matrix that you see. My colleague, Ron Johnson, was way over on the right side. He was an ENFP type. And uh, boy, we could have really butted heads because our personalities were so, so different. But fortunately, by taking those Myers-Briggs, I realized, okay, I get it. Ron is different than me. He sees things in the world differently. He processes things in his brain differently. And, and one of the things that Ron was, he was an incredible uh, brainstormer. But he had to think out loud. He had to talk things through and, and share these ideas. And what that's the type of thing that will just drive an ISTJ person crazy. Because an ISTJ person is that quiet person who sits back in the group and thinks and processes and works things all the way through to the bitter end until that cake is fully baked. And then they'll say, what's up? And they typically have brilliant ideas as well. And they're fully formed, fully processed. But that'll frustrate an ENFP type because they just think they're not part of the group. They're not participating. They're not involved. Actually, they are involved. It's just they process information differently. So as a team leader, getting involved with these teams, it is really valuable to understand the different personality types. And there are different personality type indicators that are out there. What color is my parachute or balloon or whatever? There's other ones that are quite popular. I found the Myers-Briggs maybe because it's the first one I use to be really effective in helping me um, understand individuals, but also understand teammates. And then that enables you to take advantage of the strengths of those individuals and also don't give those people tasks who, who may not be able to, to, to process you know, certain uh, pro tasks in certain ways. It's a tool that I, I found to be quite powerful in, in these, uh, these teams that we, that we have created in the past. Um, this is involved with, with team make, uh, teamwork as well, and it especially is involved in these partnerships when we're reaching out to different organizations and agencies, et cetera, and trying to pull people to the table. Engagement really is a two-way street. It really involves uh, needs assessment, uh, prioritization, uh, working through things, identifying those key elements that are of particular importance to these different groups. And you never get there uh, by just simply outreach. Um, being classically trained in extension, uh, extension involves engagement. 
where you do this two-way street thing. You communicate with communities, you find out what they need, and then you uh, provide what they need in, in a variety of different media. Whereas our perspective on outreach is more of a kind of a one-way street. So you use um, publications or you use uh, webinar, web, websites, webinars, whatever. You use your tools to just push information out there to the public. Uh, a lot of social media is, is one-way communication, pushing things out there. And I've come to realize that there's an important role in that. And a lot of people will say, actually, there's, there's two-way engagement and outreach as well. You just have to plan it up and you put it up out in front you do that work. And, and I get that now. Um, but, uh, but we see that with engagement, it, it really involves the, the communication among individuals and make, to make things happen. So with the item number six, I'm going to come back to our old buddy, Bobby Farron, uh, Mick Farron, and, and say, don't worry, be happy. Working in teams can be very challenging. Um, I suspect that you have a lot of experience. Many of you have experience working in teams and it isn't always roses um, because of the different personalities that are out there, the different agendas, motivations, things like that, uh, working in teams can be challenging. Um, I teach university classes and uh, I always do uh, group assignments with our students and they always roll their eyes. Oh gosh, no more teamwork. We, we hate this. And well, I just tell them, hey, this is life. This is what you're going to be experiencing in the future. It's really important for you now to understand nominal group processes and personality typing so you can use those as tools to help you become better team leaders and, and teammates as well. So although working in teams can be a challenge, heck, don't worry, be happy. <laughs> I trust, I promise you I won't sing anymore. Um, <clears throat> here's another item I have for you, and that is uh, looking at our professional network, and that is to expand it. Uh, don't hide in your cubby hole. And unfortunately, you know, with COVID here the last two years, Many of us had to hide in our cubby holes. Our extension programs and outreach programs were canceled. Uh, we weren't allowed to drive. Um, we had to wear masks and keep on social distancing. And so our professional networks probably declined over time. Um, so I'm gonna take a look at, at professional networks from a couple of different perspectives. Number one is uh, develop mentors, uh, work with mentors in, in your extension and outreach programming. I had the great fortune of having two incredible mentors. <clears throat> Scott Craven, he was my advisor for my PhD program. And uh, he was an extension wildlife specialist. I was his assistant for three years and I just tooled along watching and observing and seeing how things happen in Scott's world. Scott doesn't do, I should say, I don't do everything the way that Scott does, but I picked up on a lot of strengths and, and that, that he used and some of the things that I just am not strong at. And, and I haven't used some of those other elements. I mean, he's a superstar uh, of wildlife in, in, in Wisconsin. He is just a public figure here. And so if people have a question about wildlife, they call Scott Craven. Uh, he's just got that public persona. Um, I'm not quite that public persona guy, you know, the person who's going to be on TV and radio all the time. Um, but I use other ways of getting the word out and, and messaging with, with communities. So Scott's been fantastic, still a great friend. He retired, I think, 10 years ago, but he still is an active extension wildlife specialist, still involved in, in programming. And he's an incredible crook, by the way. I said cook. He's an incredible cook. <laughs> um, and, and secondly, uh, a second mentor of mine was, was Jim Miller. And unfortunately, we lost Jim Miller just, uh, just earlier this year. And uh, Jim was a national program leader for extension and natural resources. Uh, he started his career down in Arkansas and, uh, and worked in Alabama as, as an extension wildlife specialist, and then went to Washington, DC for 20 plus years, working as a national program leader. And he saw how he could connect and make things happen among extension wildlife specialists across the nation. Jim was really big in connectivity and involved get, getting extension wildlife specialists involved in, in national programming, getting them involved in conferences. And he hosted the Triennial Extension Wildlife Specialist Conference in a variety of really cool places like, uh, like uh, uh, let's see, <laughs> I gotta think for a moment. Uh, we were up in Bellingham, Washington, Portland, Maine, um, we were in Big Sky, Montana, one um, down in Gulf Shores, Alabama. These are where these triennial meetings were held in part 
it was fantastic to get these extension wildlife specialists together so they could network and communicate and share experiences and make things happen. Jim also had the behavior of, of taking a new extension wildlife specialist under his wing and helping them along. I remember Jim, I met him in, in uh, 1987 at an extension wildlife damage conference in, in North Carolina. And uh, Jim met, we, we talked, we, we you know, I think Scott Craven introduced us and we talked at length about uh, extension programming, et cetera. The next year, 1988, I was at the vertebrate pest conference in California. There's Jim Miller. We went out for dinner. We talked about a variety of things as far as extension programming and he had so much sage advice. And I remember one of his keys was to make the extension agent the extension educator, that extension network that's out there in all of the counties of the nation to make them your first priority, because essentially they are your first line of defense. People in these various counties call the extension agent to ask them for assistance. And if they call you, it means probably that there's someone sitting in their office, they need to know an answer now. And if you can give them that answer immediately, they can convey that, that person of the public leaves that office and they're thinking very highly of that extension agent. You can expand that out to being uh, proactive and that you can train extension agents, educators and assistants out there in the counties so that they're knowledgeable about, for example, extension wildlife damage management. And they have the tools then, you can provide them books and resources so that they get schooled up on it. And that's where your first line of defense comes from. The public reaches to, out to them, those local specialists, uh, or I should say local agents and educators. And if they're already uh, well-schooled and skilled, they can convey that information. And essentially there's your frontline of defense. That means you don't have to spend half the day on the phone answering these individual problems about squirrels in an attic or woodchucks under, under a, you know, a deck. Um, there's someone out there you've trained who is able to take over that type of responsibility. So mentors, I think, are really critical in this, this world of extension outreach. You can also expand your extension network by looking at, at, uh, at your colleagues. Now, the people here you see on the screen, there's, there's 16 of them. And I just went on the line very quickly. I Googled uh, Google images and looking for extension wildlife specialists. And I popped up a dozen of them. And these are all great colleagues of mine that I've worked with over the years. Uh, David Drake, Jessica Tech, Roger Baldwin, Mark Smith, Nikki Frey, Adam Yonke, Terry Mesmer, uh, Maureen Frank, I think you're on the line. <laughs> um, Adam Little, uh, Greg Yarrow, uh, Jamie Knack, and Paul Curtis. And these are, I'll say, just a few of the Extension Wildlife Specialists from across the nation that I've had the great opportunity to work with over the years. And in some cases, it's been to host a session at a conference. In other cases, it's, it's a beer at a conference, talking about a publication that we want to work on. Um, in other cases, it, like with Mark Smith recently, it was hosting the Wildlife Damage Management Conference, a national conference that we put on not long ago. Uh, Jessica Tech was instrumental in, in working in that conference, as was uh, Jennifer Summers, who's also on the line. So this is what I'm saying is expand that professional network and you have colleagues that are essentially at your same level who you can tap as far as a sounding board for ideas, for working together in teams, just making things happen. These are incredible people and they make your life really worthwhile. So uh, get involved in that extension outreach network. If you're not an extension employee, if you work within a state agency, for example, or a federal agency, Fish and Wildlife Service, whatever, find your network, find your set of, of colleagues that you can work and get involved in teams. Next thought is uh, expanding your professional network. It is associated with staff. Um, there are these extension staff members. I'm coming from the extension world again. So we have extension agents, educators, and, uh, and assistants in, I can't say every county of the nation, but there are a lot of them out there and they can be our first line of defense. So you develop teams with those people who are grassroots based, are local innovators in those communities and you can really power up your, your extension program by working with those uh, county extension staff. In addition, if you have the resources, hire staff, hire extension outreach specialists and assistants who can help you do the work. Uh, none of us is an expert in everything. And, uh, and so therefore it pays to hire diversity. 
uh, Jennifer and I, Jennifer Summers and I, we work together and we haven't done a Myers-Briggs test and compared, but I will guarantee you that we're a ways apart. You know, our personalities are different, but that's part of the reason why I hired Jennifer, because I recognize she had strengths and areas that I had weaknesses. And so she's really helped me uh, move our programs together. We've worked with each other to move our programs together. And, and as a team, uh, along with others, uh, we make things happen here at UW-Stevens Point. So expanding those, those professional networks is, is really, really important. Um, along those lines, uh, don't worry, be happy. You know, again, we're talking about working with people. And I'm not saying that you can get along with everyone, um, but uh, there are ways of working through problems, through challenges to form effective teams, uh, you know, because life is working with people. We all got in this field so we could work with wildlife. And what do we do? We work with people every day. Okay, that's just the nature of the business. Um, but it's, it's a joy to be able to do that as well. Moving down the line, number 11, program planning. I'm just gonna take a quick list. Uh, program planning is, is, is important and I can see many of you extension specialists out there rolling your eyes now. Oh gosh, logic models don't go there. Well, you know what? These are really important tools that we can use to help us in planning processes. For one, it, it forces us essentially to do needs assessments, to identify what the needs are of the communities that are out there. We can then, uh, you know, we can't handle all the problems, but we can prioritize them. We, we can't tackle everything because our resources are limited. Our inputs are limited here. And so we can determine what we can invest to make, you know, to better address those priorities. We then can look at our outputs as far as what we do and who we reach, you know, our audiences, to identify and define those audiences who our primary uh, people are that we need to get that message out and then how we get that message out. Later then we look at our outcomes, how we can, uh, what, what impacts we can predict associated with these programs that we do. And guess what? For those of you who aren't familiar with logic models, there are short-term impacts, get my cursor going, short-term impacts, there are medium-term impacts and long-term impacts. The short-term ones are what we call CASA, knowledge, uh, awareness, attitudes, uh, skills. These are things that you can measure fairly quickly. You know, uh, you do a workshop and then you do a, a pre and a post evaluation, you get an idea of the impact of your workshop. Those are associated with short-term impacts. There are also medium-term impacts. Uh, changes of behavior and practices are, are really important in these so of, of these mid-term impacts. They're harder to evaluate uh, because you have to reach out to people maybe six months or 12 months later down the road after your workshop to determine if your workshop had, shop had any impact. And then we get to the really tough ones. These are the long-term impacts, essentially social, economic, civic, and, and environmental impacts that you your programs have made. These can be very difficult, uh, but a lot of times uh, in this world of economics, you're asking how much money did you save because of practices that you learned about from me? In the world of wildlife damage management, we had a book, Prevention and Control of Wildlife Damage. And over the years, I was able to estimate through really solid survey work, uh, that book saved $210 million per year in resources lost and about $200 million per year in personnel, uh, you know, costs associated with personnel dealing with wildlife damage. Those are impacts that extension educators, uh, or, or that extension administrators just love <laughs> because they have to report upward. And uh, if you can provide them with impacts in dollars and cents, very, very important uh, uh, currency to be able to evaluate the effectiveness of programs. You can look at other aspects that are long term as well. But I'll tell you what, if you set up your programs thinking through all of these aspects and you look at these outcomes, you're set up to do evaluation of your programs. By evaluations, you're looking at different ways in which you can strengthen your programs. You're also looking at different ways in which you can convey information upward, you know, as far as those long-term impacts that those policymakers and decision makers need to be able to, to make effective decisions. So, Although I know uh, logic models have kind of been pounded in people's heads and oh, they, they, they turn, turn a blind eye sometimes, 
Uh, I personally feel that logic models are very effective in helping to organize your thoughts, to think through an entire process from start to finish, and, and it sets you up to succeed in, in various programs. All right. Uh, the benefits of plasticity. What's he talking about here? Well, my point here is to be flexible. Um, we, I think all have had to be exceptionally flexible in this uh, pandemic world uh, because we were humming along very nicely with our publications and with our workshops and with our podcasts and what have you. And then all of a sudden COVID-19 hit in, in March of 2020. Um, all of a sudden, you couldn't travel, you couldn't meet with people, you could not uh, do extension programs that were canceled. And so we had to find different ways of doing things. And for us, Jennifer Summers and I at, at UW Stevens Point, we were caught midstream in the middle of a seminar series. We were inviting speakers to come to, uh, to the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point to talk about uh, climate change. And we have, remember one speaker who spoke on fisheries and uh, the impacts of fish uh, of climate change on fisheries in Wisconsin. And it was on, uh, I think a Thursday or Friday, right before the, the big change was going to occur where people were going to shift entirely online and no one could come into the university. And boy, we, there were crickets in the audience. I mean, there were only about 20 people there and I, I felt awful for, for that speaker. It was just a, a, a sign of the times. We had another speaker who was scheduled to be there next, uh, Pierre, uh, Perry Barboza from Texas A&M, and he was going to be speaking about climate in, uh, change impacts on, on large ungulates in, in northern latitudes. And we we're scratching our head and we thought, well, let's give it a shot. Back in those days, we didn't know about Zoom like we do now. And uh, yeah, we set up a Zoom session for Perry, and it went incredibly well. Um, our students shifted over to Zoom quite quickly, and so we had student uh, students in the audience. Um, also, professionals jumped on board because they had been using uh, various webinar processes in the past, and, and so Zoom was, you know, it wasn't new, but it was something new to many people. And by that, uh, we found uh, a niche, as, as you might say, and that we were very successful with that seminar series continuing out into the pandemic. And I wanted to make sure that people, the public were aware that extension was not lost just because we were in the middle of a pandemic. We just had to change our tools. We had to be plastic. We had to make some changes and find a different way of delivering the information. We found that delivery mechanism online with Zoom webinars and seminars. And uh, we still are continuing with those just as we are right now today with, with this webinar. And we've had to be creative to do it. We had to change the way we, we operate, uh, but I think it's been very successful in the long run. And actually our participation and viewership has gone up considerably with those workshops that we've done because of the, uh, the delivery mechanism that we've had. We have some challenges with it yet too. You know, so many people, they just won't come in person if you're doing a hybrid type program because they know it's gonna be online and they'll get there later. So it's sometimes hard to have that active engagement with a public presentation that's still hybridized and, and is, is also gonna be available online, but be flexible. Uh, getting near the end, um, earn your stripes. This is an idea of, of uh, professionalism to go through continuous uh, continuing education, learn about teaching strategies and pedagogy, uh, have resources at hand that you can use to enhance your ability to engage the public. Uh, to continuously grow as a professional is really important. And I, I, I said before that by association communication, you can get to that point of trust and you can go further um, to the point of respect. And I would say that respect is something that must be earned. If someone sticks a gun in your face or a, a, a piece of legislation or a rule or law in your face, you may not respect that other person. But you can earn that respect by working with that other person, conveying a professional attitude, having expertise, having hands-on experience, and working with individuals. You can gain that respect, and ultimately, uh, through communication, you gain credibility. Credibility is something that it takes years to develop and build. And uh, unfortunately, it can be lost in an instant if you do something wrong. 
And so therefore you, you must continuously be uh, building up your credibility, building up respect for your position, and you be constantly guarded as far as making mistakes, stepping over into the advocacy world, getting too politically involved where you can lose that credibility um, that can tear down all of the years of, of building of, of, of respect and credibility that, that you've been working on. Um, so it's just a caution. Um, you can lose it very, very quickly. So, so build that credibility through professional development, education, and uh, professionalism, adhering to a code of ethics. These are all aspects that, that we know are very important in, in professionalism. Establish priorities uh, in your life. Um, we all need to spend some time at this. And oftentimes I'll say extension people are not very good at doing it because we throw our hearts and souls into our jobs. And some people forget their professional, their, they forget their personal lives and things slip. So you need to work on that balance in life. Um, we look at uh, balance, including uh, spirituality, family, health, and wealth. Um, these are all things that, that we work on, we strive to achieve. We have different goals and objectives in, in reaching any one of these goals. Um, I found an interesting book a few years ago that uh, by David Brooks, The Second Mountain, um, A Quest for a Moral Life. And, and David Brooks, he's, he's a commentator on, on Public uh, Newsweek, uh, public television show, and uh, he's on the New York Times editorial board. But anyway, he's an intelligent fellow. And uh, he recognized that there's a first mountain, and that is the one that we all strive for, and that is to, to reach health and wealth, uh, to, to be satisfied and comfortable in our spirituality and in our families. Um, but he said that there's another mountain that's out there. Once you've reached that level of comfort and satisfaction and success, and the second mountain is, is one that he sees is giving back, giving to other people, sharing your information, your knowledge, your wealth, um, and, uh, and making it a better day for other people. And largely um, in this world of extension, I will say that's a big part of our jobs actually, is you go to work every day to make someone else's life better. And it's one of those driving mechanisms that you can use to keep, keep on going. I had a little challenge some years ago where dealing with wildlife damage, everybody called in, they had a problem. Oh, what's the next problem? Okay. Um, and so you kind of get tired of dealing with people's problems. I was able to take a six month sabbatical. I worked at National Wildlife Research Center and I, I wrote, I actually worked on 10 different papers. I got a lot of stuff out of the way. And I, when I came back, I had a whole different frame of reference and that rather than dealing with people's problems, I was helping to improve their quality of life. And that essentially is what David Brooks is talking about here with Second Mountain, helping other people achieve their goals. And it gives you a really good feeling. And you get that same warm feeling um, in any avenue of a conservation education uh, extension and outreach. So keep going at it. The last point I have to make, sort of, here is, uh, is one that I say, and I've said to many students, uh, especially when they've been doing a presentation, to hit the takeoff and stick the landing. And what in the world do you mean by that? Well, that means when you're doing a presentation, you invest heavily at the beginning, you tell people what your objectives are, and at the very end, you stick the landing by wrapping it up, you summarize, you revisit your objectives, and you tie it up into a nice knot into a nice bow. And essentially, these are the, the points that I made through this presentation. Um, these are gonna be online uh, available for, uh, as a recording, so you'll be able to review these. These again, they're just kind of my brain droppings. Um, uh, they're not extremely well researched in part because of a limitation on time, but hopefully you've been able to join uh, or gain a little bit from, from some of the uh, observations and experiences that I've had over the years working on conservation education and uh, and, uh, and I hope you've maybe picked up a bit of the joy that I have in working in this field as well. I don't think I could have picked a better place. And I know my sweet spot is being an extension wildlife specialist, being a professor. That's a place where I function the best. Um, I know that I'm not the best administrator and I'm, I'm, I'm short in some of those personality traits that could get me there. And people have pushed me, encouraged me to be an extension administrator, like many of our, those have gone up before us, like Jim Miller, Scott Craven, Jim Knight, um, uh, uh, Dan Edge. These are all extension uh, 
extension wildlife specialists who became extension administrators. Um, but they found that they could have perhaps a broader impact by being, uh, you know, a leader, an extension leader, and, and having broader reach in their situation. So I think the important part here is in life, find that sweet spot. There's nothing wrong with challenging yourself. Push yourself to the limits if you wish and take on new challenges. I did that when I came to Wisconsin because I came a, became a director of Wisconsin Center for Wildlife. I'm still an extension wildlife specialist. I'm a, still a teacher. I'm kind of a four-way split here, which is a challenge and I wouldn't recommend it to any new extension wildlife specialist. But nonetheless, you, you build capacity to handle a lot of stuff and maintaining that balance in life by following a lot of these different aspects uh, will make your life very happy. And with that, I have my last slide, item 16. Oh yeah, don't worry, be happy. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to stop my screen share um, and uh, perhaps we can do some, some uh, you know, conversation if you'd like. Uh, people can chime in if you have any questions to ask of me or the other uh, members on the uh, the, uh, the webinar here, I'd uh, be happy to talk with, with others. I see, uh, let's see, a chat uh, from Abigail Archer. That was great. <laughs> Woo, thank you. <laughs> I love it. Jennifer, maybe if you wouldn't mind just uh, uh, reading through some chats, if they come up or you know, leading some questions, happy to answer some things. I see we have a few minutes left. Absolutely. So we have one question here from Jeb Beasley. He says, I help facilitate the Hunting and Fishing Academy program in Tennessee. This program is administered through our state's Wildlife Federation and our mission is to continue, or I'm sorry, to create new hunters and anglers by providing educational opportunities for youth and adult participants. We teach through virtual classes, workshops, and actual hunting fishing trips or events. Do you have any resources that would be helpful in improving our teaching strategies for this type of program? Hmm. Well, I do think there are hundreds of resources out there. Essentially what you described from what I perceived is, is this is like an R3 program. It's recruitment, retention, uh, revitalization. Some people throw a D in there, development. And uh, most of our states have an R3 program right now and they have a lot of materials that are out there to help in developing programs such as this. Um, I don't have any specific ones that come to mind, but there's actually a national R3 conference that was conducted about I think a year and a half ago, um, they had to go virtual, um, but they've done that conference a few times in the past, but there are a lot of resources out there that can help um, as far as building uh, recruitment, retention, development programs, such as you're speaking, um, both in wildlife as well in fisheries. I have colleagues here at Wisconsin um, who have been leading a program like this. I had friends in Nebraska, Jeff Rawlinson, for example, who was the leader of the R3 program there. And, and many of those individuals would be really good resources. Uh, Keith Warnke was the, the, the leader of the program in, in Wisconsin, uh, but he has moved up and just, just recently retired. So he may not want to call, but um, there are a lot of references out there. Uh, I think just Google up R3 and start there and you can drill down, find that conference uh, proceedings and, and then also speak with some of these R3 coordinators in various states. And I think you'll be able to move along quite nicely. Great, thank you, Scott. So there's no other questions at the moment, but um, if anybody has questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A um, or even in the chat and I will go ahead and read them out. Or if you have any comments, we're happy to read those out as well. Any questions or comments from the from the panel? Adam, I think it's Yankee says thank you. <laughs> hey, hi Adam. <laughs> Adam's one of the fellows right in the middle of the uh, collection of sixteen extension wildlife specialists. He's at Iowa State. Great guy. Um, I haven't worked a lot with Adam. Uh, but we spent time down in Georgia going from a conservation leaders for tomorrow program that we we were both instructors at and it was really a nice time being able to talk while driving uh, the crazy highways getting to the airport in uh, I think it was Atlanta Georgia. <laughs> hey Adam nice to see you. Yep it's and it's Adam Jonke. Yep. There's an Adam Ronke too he's down in Mich uh, Mississippi State and he's another colleague who I just didn't find a picture of quickly enough. Otherwise, I certainly would have had Adam Ronke's uh, name on board as well. Okay. Let's see. Okay. So 
nothing else yet. So, but. <laughs> well, I wish I had a few more brain droppings to throw out. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, it was an interesting time putting this together. You know, I, I out of respect for the audience, I, I should have and would have, you know, put much more time in and done more research in some of these different avenues of these uh, 16 ideas that I popped up there for you, the brain droppings. Uh, but uh, just in reality, I had too many family issues that, that I had to deal with that, that were put upon me here early this, this year. And uh, fortunately, it's going really well. My dad has responded very well to, to chemotherapy, and uh, the doctors won't say it yet, but uh, essentially he's, he's cancer-free now, which is quite remarkable. Um, we just put on a family farm auction, and uh, you know, some things sold high, some things sold low, but on average, we're pretty happy. And it was a matter of just kind of getting rid of a, of a lot of stuff. It was from a farm that's uh, been in three generations over 100 years. And it was kind of a fun tour back in history, working with, with my dad, identifying old wrenches and, and socket sets and, and stuff <laughs> that had accumulated in the barn and shop and machine shed and everywhere else, and, uh, and deciding whether it should stay or go. And, and a lot of stuff went. Fortunately, a lot of good stuff stayed too. So uh, he, we're not selling the farm, but he's, we're just downsizing, making life a little easier for him. <laughs> nice. I'm glad to hear that that went well. So, um, and I'm going to just take the last, uh, since there's, oh, so uh, Adam Janke asked Scott, how do you think we can tell the story of the impact of wildlife extension educators to land grant administrators? How can we tell it to land grant administrators? You know, Iowa State to land grant, uh, Madison, UW Madison land grant, many of them all around. Um, they, they have a history uh, with the Morrill Act and uh, the land grant is associated with where the money came from. Land was donated uh, to, to universities and then they were able to sell that land. Kind of crazy, Cornell got really rich by selling land in Wisconsin and Native American land actually. Um, that's a side note, uh, but, but how can we convey that information? I think important here is evaluation. With the programs and projects that we developed, uh, we have the opportunity, especially if you follow those logic models, to evaluate them. And some of our universities have evaluation specialists that will help you with developing questionnaires and different ways in which you can evaluate your different programs and projects. And then you can get that information on short-term, mid-term, and long-term goals. <clears throat> And those long-term goals are just like gold if you can produce information you know, on, on long-term impacts, whether they be environmental or economic or social change. Those are really, really important things. The one thing that isn't shown in the logic model, and that is public benefit. That's an even bigger picture that if you can get information like that channeled up to extension administrators um, in land-grade institutions, they, they just love it because that means that you know, we've developed these programs with target audiences in mind, but we also have public benefit in general by our educational programs, not specifically to something about economics or whatever, but actually enhancing the value of our public experience. And I'm not an expert in that area. It's really difficult to evaluate on that uh, level, but that too is something important that ex extension administrators just love having information like that, that they can share with the public decision makers, with Congress, and that all leads to money flowing down and maintaining and continuing to maintain extension programs across the country. So I know we're running short, so I'll let you have the, have the, uh, the stage, Jennifer. All right, we actually have, we have, we have two minutes left, um, but so if there is any other questions, we could probably grab one more, but I was going to use this last couple of minutes just to remind everybody that we do have another webinar coming up on July 12th, um, and that will be featuring, um, sorry, that'll be featuring Dr. Laura Downey, so please join us for that, and then we also have our events, our workshop coming that we are sponsoring at the National TWS Conference at Spokane in 2021. Uh, excuse me, 2022. So please consider joining that when you register. And otherwise, I would like to just say thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And thank you, Scott, for, for joining us. And thank you for your excellent presentation. So thank you. It's been my pleasure. <laughs> thank you. And with that, I think uh, we have we have one more minute, but we have some a lot of thank yous coming in. So <laughs>